hiding up in the palm. Got it. The Lord be with you. The First Presbyterian Church wishes to welcome all of you to worship today, whether in person or online. So if you're visiting with us, we also, uh, we're so glad to have you here. Maddox's friend, we're so glad to have you here. We would ask the visitors to find the orange colored visitors information card in the pew, fill it out and place it in the offering plate later in the surface. Also, if you have a prayer request, please fill out the prayer request card and place it in the offering plate. Um, also, um, for announcements, we have some announcements in our bulletin. I guess they still need volunteers for the soundboard. Um, we still need, we're looking for one more team of two teachers to help with our junior church, which is, right for now, is our Sunday school. And um, then Mr. Gary has an announcement. Just quickly, we are ready for you to bring in any donations you'd like to donate to the Easter breakfast. I have a list out there. It's on the little table in the High Street vestibule, and it says what we're needing down to clear down to uh, a couple of uh, bottles of syrup. So there's a list on there, and if you're willing to donate some of what we need, we would appreciate it. And uh, also, if remember on the cheese, it's shredded cheese we need. And uh, we can shred it if you get a block. That's not really a big problem. But mild. Don't tell them that. <laughs> <laughs> I just, if I can get the cheese, we'll, <laughs> I'll be happy. And uh, also, uh, the, uh, let's see. And then it's a list of what we need. So just write your name down that, you're, you know, you're going to provide so much. And uh, we'll buy what we need afterwards. Thank you. And for sure, don't forget about our dinner today. I'm sure you hear more about that for the minute for mission, but that is why I'm wearing my, that's the only gold I had, so. <laughs> okay. Oh, passing of the peace, so if uh, you'd please take a moment to share the love and peace of Christ with your brothers and sisters around you. May the peace of Christ be with you. Let us prepare our hearts for worship. All who are able, please stand for the gathering song. Let us enter our time of worship and prayer. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to gather here today. Thank you for protecting us as we traveled and for providing the way for us to meet, to learn, and grow. As we begin our worship, we dedicate this, dedicate this time to you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Please join with me in our responsive call to worship. We are the ambassadors for Christ. God has entrusted to us the message of reconciliation. We gather as God's beloved family to worship God and to offer our praise. Let us join our hearts in song and in prayer. Let us all join together for our opening hymn, 475, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing.
be seated. Now let us read together the Apostles' Creed as a dedication of our faith. I believe, I believe in God, God the Father Almighty, Almighty maker, maker of heaven and earth, and, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, Mary suffered under Pontius, Pontius Pilate, was crucified, crucified dead, and buried. He has descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
So as the choir continues to sit down, just a, a today will be a minute for mission. Our theme kind of this year for one great hour of sharing is standing in the gap, give, act, and pray. Um, we're kind of putting our focus this year, as you probably have seen, for one great hour of sharing, our focus has been on Ukraine and Ukrainian relief. And that is a lot of that is happening through one great hour of sharing, through one of the organizations supported by one great hour of sharing, and that's Presbyterian Disaster Assistance. And all if you come downstairs and you make a, a donation today, for that specifically, then that money will go to Ukrainian relief. However, we don't want you to forget about the greater one great hour of sharing. There's Presbyterian Hunger Program, which I'm sure will be involved in this relief in Eastern Europe at some point. And there's also um, self-development of people, which as people are trying to get back on their feet, I'm sure they'll be working with partners in Eastern Europe at some point. Um, as Ukraine begins, is able, whenever they are able to begin to rebuild. So even though our focus today and, has, and so far this Lent has been on Ukrainian relief and providing funds for that through the partners that Presbyterian Disaster Assistance already has on the ground in Eastern Europe, um, we just don't, I don't want you to forget um, about the the three organizations that One Great Hour of Sharing um, supports. There is one thing, and I'm just gonna mention this to you, if, if you come downstairs, um, there'll be information on the tables and you'll get a little information sheet about this. If you have never used our PushPay app, but you have a smartphone, it's going to be real easy for you to do that. If you've ever been to a restaurant, you go to restaurants, <clears throat> excuse me, these days, and they'll have a little QR code, you know, those little box, you know, the little the dots in it, like, well, how does that work? I don't know. But they have this QR code sitting on the table. You want to see our menu, hold your phone up to that on your picture, and then there's a little button to push, and boop, there's the menu. They don't even have to hand you a paper menu. Well, we're able to hook in. You will be able to hook into our push pay, our church's website and push pay, without having to download the push pay app. You'll basically be doing that. Or we'll take checks or we'll take cash, or any other way that you want to pay. So um, we hope that all of you will come downstairs. Um, it's, it, I guarantee you, you'll enjoy, excuse me, you will enjoy the meal. And um, there have been a lot of folks. That's the other thing. Um, I don't have an official count, but this last week, I bet you at least 40 different people have been in to help that were able to give some time um, during their day to come in and chop or peel, or saute, or roll little balls of mashed potatoes, and or make pierogies, or cabbage rolls, and all of those things. Um, there were a lot, a lot of people. I know they kept the list. I don't, didn't see the total, but I'm guessing probably close to 40 different people over the since Wednesday have been here um, helping with that, and what a blessing that is. So we hope that you come downstairs, and if you can't, Go on the site, write a check, make the checks out to First Presbyterian Church and put re Ukrainian relief on the bottom line. Thank you. So this is my favorite part. Come on down. Yay. Are we doing good? Okay. Come on, Ethan, Ben, Tori. Thanks for coming. Thanks for coming down. Nobody's too old to come down. Anybody that wants to can, right? Okay, so how many have seen Aladdin and his magic lamp? Or knows about Aladdin and his magic lamp? Okay, Hannah, so what happens with the magic lamp? There's a genie inside and grant you three wishes. Well, we have a Bible story today that is not exactly a magic lamp, but it is about a young man that had three wishes granted. His first wish is he wanted what? Money. 
That's right, he wanted money. Now, I know I probably shouldn't tell you guys this, but there's something called an inheritance, and usually that is stuff your mom and dad have been saving for you, but don't tell them you know that now. Anyway, okay, the next thing he wanted to do was what? Road trip. He wanted to travel around and go do things. And the third wish was, okay, he wanted to be the boss of himself. He didn't want to have to listen to mom and dad or anybody else, right? You know this story. Of course you do. We've had this story before. So, he didn't get a genie to grant that wish. He went to his dad. And he said, can I have my inheritance? Because I want to go out and I want to see the world. And I want to do what I want to do. But I need money. And so his dad let him. So he takes off. And, of course, he has money, so he's got lots of friends. And every time he saw something he wanted to do, or every time he saw something he wanted to buy, he would spend his money, and he just kept going. And then all of a sudden, not only did he not have any more money because he forgot to work along the way, he didn't have any friends either. And suddenly, he's realizing, oh, my gosh, I'm having to live now in a really bad way, worse than even maybe poorer people live, because I don't have anything. I don't have friends, my family, or anything. So he decided he was going to go home. I guess he was probably hoping that he could maybe do some work around the house or something to make, make up for him, for his not such a smart idea, right? But guess what? When he went home, his dad didn't make him do a bunch of extra chores to make up for all lose, spend, spending all his money, did he? No, he threw a big party, a big dinner and feast and invited everybody over. And he celebrated. He said, my son was gone, but now he's back. We're so happy. Remington's happy, too, I can tell. <laughs> anyway, so... This is kind of like another father we know, right? It's like God. He takes care of us. And even though we make bad decisions, sometimes we all do it. And we don't have to be young people to make bad decisions, do we? But just like the little boy in the story, his father forgave him. As long as, he, you, as, long as you go to God, pray, and you ask for forgiveness, then you're always forgiven, right? Right? So we just got to keep that in mind. We're not going to do bad decisions on purpose, but it just happens. Okay, so let us pray. Dear Father, we sometimes make bad choices. Thank you for being such a loving Father who will always take us back and forgive us when we come home to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So now... Let's go to junior church. Let us read responsively our first scripture today, Psalm 32. <clears throat> the words are on the screens. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them, and in whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For the day and night your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as the sun heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let all the faithful pray to you while you may be found. 
Surely the rising of the mighty waters will not reach them. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. Do not be like the horse or the mule, which have no understanding, but must be controlled by bit and bridle, or they will not come to you. Many are the woes of the wicked, but the Lord's unfailing love surrounds the one who trusts in him. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous. Sing, all you who are upright in heart. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, um, I know we already had announcements and all that, but please make sure to look through everything because we do have a lot of different stuff and a lot of things going on today and a lot of things going on this week. Today was our first or the first practice for the youth for their uh, musical that they'll be performing in May. So today was the first time for that. And that's for kids of all ages except the little teeny tiny babies who I hope get to play trees or something, right? At least. But they don't need to practice that. They're very good at being trees. Um, and if you do have the littlest of kids, uh, we do have that class upstairs with Jill and Linda. So that started again today. So if you have the preschooly kids or preschooly grandkids or preschooly neighbors, they can come to that. And if you have kids of any age older than that, then we do have uh, all of that going on for the terrible parable. And my, that works out really well for my son, who does not like to sing who I'm sure he'll get into it and get some other stuff. And he found out today that he wasn't doing it like at a theater. Like he thought it was going to be over there at the high school, uh, that auditorium thing or something. So he seemed a little more comfortable. It's good for Caitlin, who just loves to sing. And it was so nice to see all the kids and all the youth and the adults there uh, working with them. So thank you for that. So we have that going on. And then obviously we have our Tuesday night dinners. We had our last Tuesday night dinner. We had over 30 people there. Uh, eating dinner and watching the show, and the show was a good show. I'd never seen it before. We enjoyed it. We watched the show, and we talked, and we had 10 folks uh, come from uh, Blanken, the other church. What's that church called? Thank you. We had 10 folks come from All Saints, and their pastor came too, so there was two pastors. We battled it out, and I think, I think we tied, so it was fine. I'll try to win this week, but I think we tied. So it was a very nice, it was a nice time we have that coming up. So that's again this Tuesday and next Tuesday. And it's a TV show, it's not a movie. So that's pretty good in that if you missed last week, you'll, you'll, you'll get it if you come this week. And that was a, a good time. So we got lots of nice stuff coming up and that doesn't even get into when we're talking about Easter, which is coming. It's coming. But we have lots of fun stuff planned for Easter too. So please just make sure to look through it. And I know the newsletter will come out as soon as uh, I send stuff and we all send stuff to Ray Jean. Because when the newsletter comes out late, it's not Ray Jean. It's usually me. But it is, we got to make sure we get stuff to her. So I just wanted to throw all that out there. Now today we're doing uh, the parable of the lost son. And the parable of the lost son, we just heard. And so you get the idea. You already know the story. But I wonder if we could look through the story today and look at it from maybe more than one point of view, because we have the lost son, we have the prodigal son, but we also have the son who is always there. We have the older son, the, the uh, older son who never left, and we have the father. So we have quite a few different characters going on in here, and it's not just about a man who takes all his money and runs. It's just as much about the man who stayed and continued to work with his father. And it's just as much about the man who was the father who both had both of these sons and I think dealt with both of them pretty well. But it's also about, because this is Jesus and Jesus tells allegories and Jesus tells parables, it's also about the Pharisees. And I think at church, I think oftentimes we mistake the Pharisees for the bad guys, 
And we say, oh, I know those Pharisees, they're naughty, and we should all boo every time we say it. But here's the problem. More often than not, the Pharisees are a direct one-to-one relationship to us. So more often than not, the Pharisees are the church today. More often than not, we get to play the roles of the Pharisees. So we have this story, and probably all of us would wish that we were either this very forgiving father, or we would wish that we were this diligent son, who maybe was a little jealous, but all in all was a good son. Or maybe some of us are proud that we are the son that learned our lesson and came back to Jesus. But just as often, we're the Pharisee that Jesus is telling this story to. Because we are the people of God, just as the Pharisees were seen to be. We are the people who have been taught the word of God, just as the Pharisees had been. The Pharisees are the people whose friends would turn to when they had questions about God. Just as y'all, hopefully, are the friends your friends turn to when they have questions about Jesus. So we're not always the Pharisees, but sometimes we are. We're not always the dad, or the prodigal son, the lost son, or the son that stays. But there's lessons to view from each one. And so the story set up, it comes from verses 1 and 2 of chapter 15, and it says, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathered around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and teachers of the laws muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. And so this is the setup. And Jesus tells two other parables. And then he goes into this one. And this is kind of the big closer for the story. So Jesus is telling this story in reaction to both the fact that he is eating with sinners and tax collectors and that there are these Pharisees that are mad at him for doing that. That are mad at him at doing that. So that's where the story comes from. And so now we go down to verse 11, which is the beginning of the story. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. And so he divided his property between them. And now, I think it's important that we know, just sort of as a backstory to this, that father did not have to do that. That father did not have to do that. And actually, according to the rabbinical law, shouldn't have done that. This is not something he was required to do. I think sometimes we read this story and we just think the dad's like, oh, you got me, here's the money, and he goes. But it's not the case. And as the younger son... And having two sons, the younger son would have gotten one-third of everything. One-third of everything. So imagine that here, just for a moment. We sit here, and we see our spot from the three points of view. And as a father, first of all, look how much he's giving up by obliging his son's request. He is giving up a third of all that he has. A third. Imagine that. A third. I get mad when my kids want to eat off the adult menu at the restaurant. You're not going to eat it. One third. And he didn't have to give it to him, but he did. So imagine what this father is losing. He's losing a third of everything he has, but also he is losing his son. He is losing his son. And imagine the hurt he would feel as well. Your son can't even wait until you die. Your son wants to leave you. Your son wants to go away. And the idea here, too, is that he didn't just say, give me a field and I'm going to go live on it. A third of everything you own. I want it, and I want it now. And he gives it to him. What kind of pain and hurt 
that father must have been feeling. But what then becomes the motivation of the son? Well, the son that asked for it, the lost son, the son that leaves, well, I think his motivation is he doesn't like it there and he wants to go. Give me some money, I got things to do. Give me some money, I got things to do. He looks out in the world and he says, well, I could be tending sheep. He looks out in the world and he says, well, I could be doing this work of my father. I could live here under my father's roof. Or I could get some money. I can go. And I can do some fun stuff. And I can do some fun stuff. So he does. Now, what about the older son? Now, the older son, you know, this takes a little bit of conjecture since it's not actually in the scripture what the older son feels about this. Maybe he heard this story and he goes, well, wait a minute, can I get my two-thirds? I wonder what this older son feels. He sees this younger son disrespect his father because that's what he did. He sees this younger son take off with a third of everything his father owns. He sees this younger son go. And we don't know what he thinks. It could be so much. He could be sitting there thinking, I didn't know I could do that. Maybe I should do that. He could be jealous. He could be jealous going, well, I can't do that because if I take two-thirds of everything he has, then my dad will have nothing. He could be there and he could be living this life out of sense of duty and honor. He could be there and he could live in this life out of a sense of enjoyment. He could go, why would I want to go anywhere? He could just be a good son who doesn't want to leave, who doesn't want his inheritance yet, who is enjoying where he is. He could be looking at that younger son with worry, with worry and sadness. My brother is leaving and I am worried about him. He is leaving and he is no longer be a part of my family. He could look at his brother and he could look upon him with contempt and say, how dare he hurt my dad that way? How dare he do that? That is not what you're supposed to do. That is against the law. He could be looking at his brother and just be scared and afraid for him. He could be looking at his brother and be jealous. If I had asked first, I could get that too. But we don't know how he's feeling. But the reality is, in any given situation, that's what we get. When we see someone we love go off in a weird direction, go off in a way they should not go, we're either jealous, or we're angry, or we're sad, or we're worried as being the one who stayed behind. Not long after that, the younger son got together all that he had and set off to a distant country where he squandered his wealth on wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So here's an important note. He spent everything we had, and we like to focus on that. He went out there and he wasted his money on all these different things, on wild living. He went out there and he wasted all he had, but he also suffered some trouble. Would this same trouble have happened if it weren't for this famine? So he also fell on some hard times. So the situation of this younger brother is not all his fault. Yes, he went off on his own. Yes, he took all of his, a third of his parents' money. Yes, he went off to this country and spent on wild living. But he also suffered of a famine. And we think of that today. Like if you've ever looked out in the world and you'll see some people who sin and seem to suffer way more for it than others. Some people who sin and they seem to suffer way more for it. They did the same thing I did, but they got in trouble. They did the same thing I did as a teenager, but the cops got them. They did the same thing I did, but they got sick. But they lost out. And so here this man goes off, and not only did he do all this, but he also suffers because it's a severe famine. And what does he do? He gets a job. And isn't that what he should have done? Isn't that what he should have done? He gets a job. 
So because of the famine, it says, that in the whole country, and he began to be in need. And so he went out and hired himself. He went out and got a job. Isn't that what we would have wanted him to do? Isn't that what we would have wanted him to do? He went out and got a job. But because of the famine, because he was in a far-off country, because he was who he was, he got a job feeding pigs. And he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. And so now we look at the father, and now we look at this son, and this son, maybe we should start feeling for him. Maybe we should start being worried about him. Now, it's a little different back in the day, but right now, if the same kind of thing happened, what if I started noticing that I started noticing this way of living that my son or that my brother was having in some far off country? Maybe I'm stalking him on Facebook. I don't know. But I'm checking in on him. I'm finding out things. What if I see this unfold? As a father, I see this unfold. I see my son with the pictures. I see my son posting these pictures of these wild parties, posting these pictures of these extravagant presents and things that he's buying, posting all these pictures. And what do I think? Oh, boy, he's going to be in trouble. And then I see him post uh, on job boards. And then I see him getting skinnier and looking sick. Then I see him looking in trouble. How am I feeling? How am I feeling now? Well, as a father, you would want him to just come home, right? As a father, you would want to fix it, right? You would just want them to come home. You would just want them to come home. As a brother, though, as a brother, we have the same feelings coming up that was coming up before. Maybe we're jealous as we see these pictures of parties. Maybe we're jealous as we see these fancy clothes or whatever else he's spending money on. Maybe we're jealous of this time that he's having. And then... We start to think, oh, look at him. As he gets skinnier and sickly, as he loses his job, as he loses what he has, what do we feel? Are we sad for him and we long for him to be home? Are we just worried sick about him? Or are we thinking, oh, now he's getting what he deserves? Now he's getting what he deserves. Is it cosmic retribution? Now he's getting it. And we feel all these different things in our lives when we have something like this happen. You see someone and someone hurts us, whether it's seriously or not as seriously. We look at them and we can see them and we could feel bad for them and we could wish that they knew better. We could see them and we could hope that they change. We could see them and we could hope that they're different. Or we could see them as they suffer and say, good. And say, good, that's what you deserved. And maybe wish they suffered a little bit more. When he had came to his senses, it says in verse 17, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare and I am here starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and I will say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And so he got up and went to his father. He got up and went to his father. I think today that'd be kind of like getting that text out of nowhere. Can I come home today? Can I see you today? Can I get some lunch today? How you doing, dad? I once knew a woman whose son after, well, his wife died in a car accident. And when his wife died in a car accident, he just started doing drugs and going crazy. And eventually he decided to go to the Middle East. And he went to the Middle East and she would hear from him about once a year for a decade. And then she didn't hear from him at all. And then one day, she got a phone call 
from the Columbus airport that said, can you pick me up? Can you pick me up? I imagine it just like that day. I imagine it just like that day. When I first heard his story, it made me think of this story. And his was driven by loss, not greed or jealousy, not a desire for wild living. But he had finally decided to come home. But while he was still long away, his father saw him and was filled with compassion with him and ran to his son and threw his arms around him and kissed him. Now the tradition here would have been that that would not have happened. The tradition here would have been that the father would have waited in his house for some sort of gesture. Some sort of gesture. He would have waited even if he really wanted to do what he did and run out there and give him a hug. Traditionally, what he should have done, what he was supposed to do, was to sit in his chair and wait for some gesture from his son. Maybe his son gives him a gift. Maybe his son talks to his servants and says he wants to apologize and asks permission to come in the house. Maybe something of that nature. Some sort of first move had to happen from the son. But he didn't do that. He ran off. While he was still a long way off, his father saw him, was filled with compassion with him, and ran to his son and threw his arms around him and kissed him. And kissed him. As his son, as his son that was lost, this would have been a worrisome minute as you're coming down the hill to see your dad running at you, because that would not be what you were expecting. To see your dad coming at you, that is not what he would have been expecting. But he, is, he comes and he is met with a son who holds and kisses him. And yet we can see in this, even that act, even that act was so very against tradition, even that act on which he ran out of the house and made, well, I guess not the first move, because the first move was the son coming home, but made the biggest move, the initial move of contact, made that initial move of contact with him. It came to him, and you, you know he had to be looking happy. Looking happy, hugging him, giving him a kiss. The son still expected the worst. Because here's what the son said. The son said to him, Father, I've sinned against you and heaven. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. He did it just like he practiced. He did it just like he practiced. And as soon as he had said that, his father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Bring a ring and put it on his finger. And sandals and put it on his feet. Bring a fattened calf and kill it. Let us have a feast and celebrate. Let us have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and now is found. So they began to celebrate. So this son, this son who had hurt him so much, this son who had taken a third and wasted it, this son who had ran off, This son who had abandoned all of his roles, had abandoned what he was to do on this sort of farm or whatever, who had abandoned all of his roles, who had done this thing, who had hurt him so, comes and is met with nothing but joy and is immediately accepted. There's no time required here. You come, you be my servant, And maybe a year from now we'll talk. Right? None of that. No time. No test. No earning back of trust. He is immediately accepted as a son. This son of mine. As a father, I can't imagine. As a father, I can't imagine. And then for hearing, that, uh, and hearing that first time, the story of this man who goes off 
and is gone in the Middle East and comes back after uh, several decades and comes back and just sends this text, this joy they felt, even though they knew he was hurt. He didn't really talk about what happened to him when he was gone. They kind of assume he was in prison, but they don't know that. He never really talked about it. And he was deeply hurt. He was still deeply hurt. He still fought on and off again with drugs. He was still very hurt. He still had lots of issues to deal with. But he was accepted as well as their son. They bought a trailer for him and stuck it on their land. They let him be their son again. They let them be their son again. Meanwhile, the older son, now we don't have to imagine what the older son feels because he tells us. So the son that was lost is here and is just somehow coming to the realization that he is being accepted, is coming to the realization that he does not have to be a slave or a certain, is coming to the realization that all that horror that happened to him when he had left is gone and done. He is coming to the realization that he has been accepted back into the family that he had taken off from. So that son is just amazed and that father is coming to the realization that his son is back. He says, my son, he was dead and now he's not. He was lost and now he isn't. And they celebrated. And as he celebrated, and as this first son celebrated, as the lost son celebrated, the whole of the area, the whole of the household was celebrating. In verse 25, though, it says, Meanwhile, the older son was in the field, and when he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him, what's going on? The servant says, your brother has come and your father has killed a fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. He has him back safe and sound. Now here, this story gives us the feels, doesn't it? Doesn't it make us feel good? Doesn't it make us feel good up to this point? It probably makes those Pharisees feel pretty bad, too. Those Pharisees, are, if you followed the Pharisees' rules, then that father shouldn't have accepted his son back like that. Then that father shouldn't have accepted him. Then that father shouldn't have been celebrating with him. But they were, just as Jesus was celebrating with the sinners and the tax collectors. We are so happy, says Jesus, because my children are back. But the older brother behaved more like the Pharisees and often like we do. He became angry. He became angry and refused to go in. When a lost sheep is found, when a servant becomes a son, when someone who is lost, when someone who is dead becomes alive again, when someone who is lost becomes found, that is a time for joy and let it made him angry. All these years, the older brother became angry and refused to go in, and so his father, again breaking with custom, comes out to him and pleads with him to come inside. But he answered his father, all these years I have been slaving for you and have never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me a young goat so I could celebrate with, your, with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill a fattened calf for him. This son of yours. When the servant was asked, he said, your brother has come home. When the father is met, he says, my son has come home. When the older brother is angry, he says, this 
son of yours. This son of yours. It sounds like the common argument at home, well, he didn't get that from me. This son of yours. You have accepted him. You have accepted him. You have given him good things even though he has disobeyed you. I have obeyed you and you have not given me anything. He sees this as having been a slave. Even though he has been the son, even though he has always been there with the father, he sees his work, he sees his relationship as being a slave that has been unrewarded. So maybe we do know how he felt when that son left originally. He was jealous, wasn't he? Maybe we do know what he felt like when that son left. He was jealous. He saw what his brother was doing and didn't see it as something that was wrong, but something that he knew was wrong, but he couldn't do. Something he wished he could do. Something he wanted to do. Something he was jealous of. And when this son does everything wrong and he comes back, when this son of yours does everything wrong and comes back, you kill a fattened calf. You celebrate it like no other. You celebrate it like no other. And the father says, my son, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. I think sometimes we, who have not left, miss out on the richness, the vastness, and the grace that we have because of that. I think we downplay the pain that other people who are rebelling are feeling right now. The pain of those who are squandering their lives on drugs the pain of those who are squandering their lives on addiction, the pain of those who do not know forgiveness, the pain of those who have been ostracized by their families, the pain of those who do not yet know Jesus, the pain of those who are lost. The pain of those who are lost. And yet we also downplay the joy we should feel. We also downplay the grace that we have, that we are not of those. The grace that we have, that we have always had the Father with us. The grace that we have had, that we did not suffer that same fate. We did not have to spend that time wishing we were eating what pigs ate. We do not have to sell, we do not have to remember that time where we were disobedient and we paid for it so severely. We who are the children who stayed. Or we who are the children who came and have been around a while. We must remember. We must remember the joy there is. We must remember the wonder there is. We must remember how much suffering we have not had to face. We must remember that there is a wonder to being found There is a wonder to not having been lost. So this son says, this son of yours. And this father says, but this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. We are brothers. We are brothers. We're not enemies to the people who do not know Jesus. We're not better than like we talked about last time. We're not other folks with no connections. We are brothers to those people in this world who are suffering addiction. We are brothers to those people who are lost. We are brothers to those people who do not know Jesus. We are brothers to those people who are suffering around this world. We are brothers. when we go downstairs for this meal, some of us might think of it as something we're doing for other people. We might go downstairs and we might think of the time we spent this week chopping up beets 
Or we might think about the time we spent setting up tables. Or we might think about the money we put in offering plates. And we might think about it as something we're doing for other people. But we're doing this because our brothers are hurting. Because our brothers are in need. Because our brothers are lost. Lord God, we come before you to this day repentant at how little value we place in the grace you give us every day. We come before you repentant on how little we see the pain of the people around us. How much we play off the lostness and the connections we have to our brothers and sisters around this world. Lord God, may we always remember the joy that we have as people who know you, the joy that we have as people who are found. And may we be a people who work to bring back those who are lost. In the name of Jesus, amen. Let's all stand and sing our next hymn, Amazing Grace, uh, 649. Please be seated. I'd like to ask the ushers to come forward as we prepare ourselves to give our tithes and offerings.
Please join me in the unison prayer of dedication. Lord Jesus, you who fed 5,000 with the gifts of a young boy, we pray that you will transform our gifts to feed many hungry people through the ministry and mission of this church. Amen. Please be seated. So our prayer requests that came in the in the uh, offering plate today. Uh, we have prayers for Ellie Robinette, who injured her knee playing basketball. We don't know how serious it is. So prayers for her. For uh, Ken Klein, who is diagnosed with throat cancer and is on home, is been sent, is going to be on, excuse me, chemotherapy and radiation. So prayers for him. And prayers for the family of Donald Webb and of Steve Mitchum. Uh, they both passed this week. So prayers for their family. Now, of course, we'd like to make sure we all are aware and keep looking, looking through our prayer requests. Uh, they're all full in the bulletin. Prayer requests for our mission co-workers. Prayer requests for our service men and women. Prayer requests for just those who need prayers. For people who are in surgery and recovering, uh, for those with health concerns, and for those who are dealing with cancer or are on hospice care. Also, if you're one of the people that asks for one of these prayer requests, if, it's, if they don't need to be on the prayer request list anymore, please let, let Ray Jean know or, so we can make sure we're praying for them. And updates, too. Updates, too. So make sure to keep continued prayer for them and to pray for whatever is on our hearts and minds today. So, Lord God, we come before you today in prayer with many needs and wants and desires. We look around this world, Lord God, and we can see so much need and we can see so much want, but also we can see so many blessings and so much that is wonderful and good. We thank you for those things. We thank you for times in which we as people rise up and do good for those who fight the good fight, for those who reach out their hands to their brothers and sisters, for those who look around the world, and for those times in which we are aware that the folks around us are not just God's trouble, and they're not just random people, but they're our brothers and sisters, and they could be our brothers and sisters in the Lord. So we pray for them. We pray for our vision as we see people around the world that we don't downplay the suffering of others or ourselves, and that we also do not downplay the grace and love of Jesus Christ, the grace and love offering to us. We pray as a people that we do not ask more of others than you do. We pray as a people that we could be forgiving. We pray as a people that we can be those who mirror the love of Christ. We pray for everyone that is in need and in want, we pray for everyone who is in a time of joy and wonder. We pray for all those who are on our prayer request list. And we pray for all those who are on our hearts and minds. And we continue to pray by saying that which you have taught us. And our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's all stand and sing our closing hymn, which is, There is Now a New Creation.
Okay, so I'd like to thank and welcome everybody for coming down. If you can come downstairs, consider the food blessed because people are coming and going and coming and going. So just consider it blessed. And if you don't consider it blessed enough, bless it. Bless it yourselves. But please, if you can come downstairs, please do. And if not, that's okay. We all understand. But I am just so glad we should worship together today. And I feel like it's really happy in here today. It just seemed like everybody saying hymns louder. It feels like a good day. So let's keep that going. Let's go forth in the love of God, the peace of Christ Jesus, and the united power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Amen.